Um, so let's get started. Um, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our MVVA's panel today. Um, and thank you for joining our session. I'm Rachel Sprouse. I'm a graduating MLA student at Cornell, and I'll be starting us off today. Um, if you have questions for today's speakers, please use the Zoom Q&A feature, and we'll take questions at the end if there's time. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the University of Hawaii at Manoa's MLA program for sponsoring this talk. At the UHM School of Architecture, students trained in the extraordinary Hawaiian landscape with its rich natural and cultural history are equipped with strategies needed to enhance a beautiful, resilient, and healthy built environment. Focused on ecological and social sustainability by design, their MLA program advances contemporary landscape design teaching theory and practice in tropical Asia Pacific coastal regions. Thank you. Sounds beautiful. <laughs> Today we have a panel discussion with MBVA. Part one will be Laura Solano and Adrian Hefflick presenting on an evolving framework for equity. Laura and Adrian from Michael Van Valkenburg Associates will share how issues of equity and access are woven into the way the firm practices design and the ways in which the firm's culture continues to develop. MVVA's process, lessons learned, and commitments ahead to our Black, their Black Lives Matter framework will also be reviewed. Part two will be Scott Strieb presenting on Gathering Place, a park for posterity. Our moderator today is Giselle Major, who has been working with MBVA since last June to help craft the firm's BLM slash JEDI framework and develop strategies for its implementation. Giselle practiced landscape architecture before working as a consultant and policy strategist at an interdisciplinary firm in Seattle. In addition, she has founded her own consultancy, Well Outside, a thought lab that offers professional strategy, research, and design consultants. I'm just Thank you so much for that introduction, Rachel. So uh, my name is Adrian Hefflick, and I'm really happy to be here today with Laura, with Giselle, with Scott, uh, and to share you share more about all the work that MVVA has been doing. Uh, so our talk, uh, we have five big learning objectives, and Laura, Giselle, and I are going to really focus on the first two here in this first 30 minutes. Um, you know, we will explore MVVA's experience creating and refining a framework for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we will also share what we've learned about mentorship kind of through this process and how supporting design leaders uh, through, through all of our work is so important. Uh, Scott's portion of the talk uh, is really gonna focus in on these uh, final three objectives that are here on the screen. Uh, he's gonna investigate how public space and private philanthropy are advancing equity goals in MBVA's work. Uh, he's gonna consider uh, multiple ways that designed play spaces can support childhood development and uh, he's also gonna discuss the ways in which parks can help strengthen communities. So we're really excited today to present all of this to you. So uh, again, here we all are, um, and we're really lucky to have Giselle who will uh, help moderate some questions as, as well at the end of all of this. Um, we're seeking this discussion to be uh, really involving with a lot, of, um, a lot of time as well from answering questions from the audience. So please stick around for that. Thanks, Adrian. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk with you about MVVA's evolving framework for equity. And I'm going to be honest, it's been a hard year in all sorts of ways. I mean, who could imagine operating in a pandemic? But looking back, I can truly say that the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work that we've done, also known as JEDI, by the way, that the JEDI work we've done has really pulled the firm together. Um, it has created a place for us all to speak openly, for us to set a plan, and for us to go forward and implement that plan. And, you know, before the pandemic happened, 
you know, we have two offices and maybe sort of an office in Denver with Scott. And, you know, I can say that just in the day to dayness of getting our work done, that there wasn't as much cross pollinization as there could be between the offices. But this work has just completely uh, changed that. Um, I think that people know each other better than they ever have and understand each other. So in this, we had to take a pretty hard look at ourselves. You know, it was painful at times. Um, there certainly wasn't any shortage of opinions or criticisms um, all around. But honestly, I think we weathered it. Um, we're still weathering it and it's made us better. So one of the first things we looked at is um, you know, MVVA has always had people of color in it. In fact, I am one of those, but we don't and haven't had any black landscape architects. And this process made us stop in our tracks. And I'm happy to say that we've changed that. Um, next. So this historic moment really caused us to act. Um, we realized that we really have been complicit unintentionally with a culture that we completely disagree with. Um, it wasn't enough to you know, support a slogan that we had to be actively anti-racist in our work, um, help others to be that way in the communities that we touch and to make sure that landscape architects ourselves to begin with really took a hard look at this. Um, we have an obligation to our firm and the profession of landscape architecture. Um, those who do design and the communities that we work with, um, all of those to make positive changes um, in our world. Next. So these are two of the, the pieces of our um, JEDI framework plan that we would like to talk about today. There's much more at our website, so please visit that. There's a tab that says Black Lives Matter. But today we're gonna talk about, we need more black people in landscape architecture. And as landscape architects, we can give back. These are really simple statements, but I think like our, our design work, we worked really hard to kind of get these down to very succinct and clear and powerful statements. Um, so next one. You know, as we were starting this whole process, we realized that we weren't starting from nothing, that, in, you know, everybody operates within their own framework. And our framework is landscape architecture and our love of landscapes and our you know, complete devotion to making places for people um, to kind of step aside in their lives and find joy and calm and um, togetherness in landscapes. So we realized that we actually have been doing a lot of this um, with our projects and with our clients and with our constituents, you know, always in design work, context and constituents are essential. Where are you working? Who's, who are you serving? And our community meetings um, have brought to us the message that every voice matters. And then looking at our designs after they're built makes us realize that Every design decision that you make has an effect on community building. So if you don't do something that really um, engenders that, you're not going to be as successful um, in bringing people together. And then last, um, in our designs, you need to offer something for everyone. And fortunately, landscape is just such a wonderful framework for that, um, but it makes it, makes it even more important. So Adrienne, I think you're up next. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. 
Uh, so going off of what Laura just shared, we found a balance. We were able to try to course for our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion goals that both grew from our expertise and our experience as landscape architects, um, but also kind of recognized what we didn't what we didn't know and what we needed to learn. Um, so uh, we we organized our actions into these four broad categories. We're we're really kind of focused on this BLM Jedi framework as a way that we can both, uh, as a firm, have immediate actions that we're taking that we're going to describe in the following slides, as always, as well as a long-term vision that we're going to stay committed to. And then uh, there's also these three other categories of how we're achieving this change. So we're growing and sustaining our office culture in a way that recognizes the need for more black, uh, black landscape architects, both within our own firm and the profession more broadly. We're reaching out to others in new ways. So that touches on both collaborations with our peers, our colleagues, with industry leading uh, groups to really understand what the best practices are around Jedi topics. And then as well, engaging with communities is essential. It's been essential to our work over the years, but now we're looking at it at this lens of diversity, inclusion, equity, uh, and really making sure that our work is having the intended impact. So it's not just enough uh, to kind of start out with those good intentions, um, but we're really looking hard and, and um, seeing the ways in which we can, uh, we can affect change. So at first, um, you know, uh, roughly about a year ago, on the heels of uh, losing, losing George Floyd and, and the start of Black Lives Matter protests, um, we started this charge for ourselves about how MBVA could have a positive impact within our own firm. And the first step that we took was that uh, we created a committee. And at the, at the beginning, it was called the Working Group on Hiring. And this group that I was a part of, that Laura was a part of, that Giselle ultimately uh, as well came out uh, and helped guide us. Uh, we, were, we were asking questions, we were doing research and reading articles. We were trying to understand what a firm would look like when it fully embodies Jedi and anti-racist practices. And we soon realized that hiring was too narrow a focus to really have the intended impact. So this led our group of employees to really reframe what we were doing, um, to talk about team building and to think of this kind of team building moment as just one step in a path that includes really important things that the firm is already doing, but that we could do better around mentorship and support, retention and growth, and ultimately supporting designers into becoming full-on leaders in the profession. So this is a continuum and uh, the potential for MVVA to have an impact lies in how we think of team building. Uh, and it's uh, just so important in terms of how we bring in new staff um, and also the ways in which we integrate them into our design process uh, and bring them along in all of the resources and the projects that we do. And then secondly, um, we started to look back. And so team building becomes this kind of pivotal moment because it reflects outward to the work MVVA does as well into the profession and into the world beyond. We wanna support more black lives, uh, more, more black voices in public space making rather. And, and, you know, and we, we wanna support more black landscape architects. So we need to carry that message through so much of the work we do in terms of the networking and the outreach we do with schools, um, the way, you know, that comes into the play in terms of the, um, the decisions that we make um, in terms of where we send staff for teaching events and things like that. Um, and we've really expanded the schools that we actively speak and interact with and teach with um, to include historically black colleges and universities and a host of others. So that work with the schools is also tied into uh, the work that we do around engagement and outreach and expanding the ways in which we're educating new audiences about the really amazing impacts and potential for landscape architecture. So one of the first things we did was to reach outside ourselves and that took a number of forms. First of all, we started calling our, our colleagues, what's going on in your firm? Um, what are you thinking about? Um, it wasn't a moment to be competitive, but in fact, come together for the landscape architecture community. Um, we also looked to industry um, groups such as the Landscape Architecture Foundation we had already done quite a bit of work on this topic even before the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and we found out you know, who they, taught, who they had spoken to, what they'd seen. Um, we talked about any um, 
polls they had taken. And it was really helpful. Um, they were really instrumental in sort of guiding us towards who we needed to speak with and a path that we might take. One of the easy things for us to do right away was to support access to symposiums and events and resources. So for instance, when um, the Black Lives Matter um, by Walter Hood was published, we offered it to everybody in the firm. We offered to buy it to everybody in the firm. We also immediately set up a um, Friday notice, which told people about upcoming events um, related to um, Black landscape architecture and also wider topics as well. Um, we've always supported education, but we wanted to also point people to things that specifically address this issue. And then, you know, eventually it came to a time for us to really speak with experts. And so we have hired Lee Thompson um, to help us with assessments in the firms. And in fact, we've already done an assessment which basically um, approached everybody in the firm. He spoke with people, we sent out um, surveys, et cetera, and soon we'll have the results of those. Um, but we also looked into and, and followed through on equity training for senior staff and administrative staff. And as soon as we get the results of the um, equity survey, we're gonna fashion um, a program for our staff as well. Giselle has really um, been with us from the very beginning. And um, she helped us craft our first um, 2020 Black Lives Matter statement that's on the, the website. And she also helped us throughout the process to be our soundboard, to push us in directions we needed to go, to um, be fresh eyes on everything that we were doing. So um, I think we'll take a moment here. And Giselle, I think you have some questions for us. I do, thank you. Um, hello to everyone on the chat. Um, I. I guess since working with you all, I've seen that you are really driven by questions, whether that's um, something you're working on for a project or an internal initiative, or even building a presentation. You think of it as a design question. And so I'm gonna flip that on you today and ask you a few of those uh, that you normally do self-reflectively. And I think so far through the presentation, we've seen a good show of you taking this historical look at what's been happening and even at a fast clip what's happened over the last year. And I think we could fairly say that it's been a bit of a summary of what you all have done. Um, and so I would be curious to know what from things that you have talked about with the group today, or maybe some other things that are deeper into the framework what are those things that you're most proud of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's all right, I'll answer that first. Thank you, Giselle. Um, I'm most proud of the work that we've begun and that we're continuing to do around community engagement and looking really hard at the continuum of, of past MBVA projects, the tools we've used, the things that have worked really well, the ways in which we could improve around topics of community engagement and projecting that into the future to looking really hard at how we can be incorporating more black voices into the creating the creation of public spaces. Um, so it's uh, really exciting. It's a, an exciting moment within MBVA to be doing that work because it's um, it's very it's kind of it's very reflective in a way that we aren't always uh, just because we're we're so passionate about our work and we're often going from project to project. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm just really proud that we're um, looking so seriously um, to really chart the potential impact of our work and our dedication to community engagement and ensuring that our work ahead is going to be, um, you know, really strong and, and, um, and kind of affect the change that we're seeking. And for me, um, it's been both internal and external. Um, externally, you know, when you start to look at the statistics, I may not have this number completely right, but there's only something like, you know, a very low percentage of um, black landscape architects in our profession. 
Um, I think it was 12%, um, may not even be that much, um, but that's ridiculous. It, it just was a startling number. Um, and that I think was really how we realized that we couldn't just take care of things at home, that we had a responsibility to go out to our profession and also to reach out because where, where are landscape architects going to come from, from early um, intervention and exploration into young kids, right? Um, showing up to talk about the profession on a career day, um, working with students to give them a project to, to work on. But the other thing I'm really proud of is that um, we have worked really hard to make sure that people in the firm have a voice in this. Um, and we've done that um, by coming together to talk, by releasing newsletters, um, by asking people's opinions, um, and we realized, you know, we need to take care of our staff in a much deeper way um, than just giving them, you know, interesting projects to work on. So we'll talk a little bit more about both of those, but um, I think that does it for me. That's a great answer. Um, so was yours, Adrian. I think both of those things would make me pretty proud too. And maybe this is a good chance for us to move from what is happening presently, what you had done uh, previously in retrospect, to what you're kind of thinking about in the future. Um, so you've done a great job to acknowledge everyone on your team and even those in the communities that you're serving have had different experiences. They maybe started at a different time and may lead longer into the future before there's some resolution and comfort. Um, but you have noticed that there's some things that need to be changed urgently, others that you have given yourself the grace and understanding to know this might take a little bit more time to either change institutionally or culturally within the firm. So I would ask you, maybe you can animate for us a little bit what you think the framework goes on to outline for the future of teams or the communities uh, that you're serving um, in MVVA. Uh, so, and then when I say institutional changes, I'm thinking more MVVA as a firm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that our um, our continued and, and, you know, beginning outreach to communities is one of the most important things we can do because it carries the message to the street, to the population, to the community, to everyone, that in fact, this is a really critical issue to invite Black voices into the making of landscapes, um, and that there is a place at the table for, um, for that voice, and that our projects will be enriched by that. Mm -hmm. I agree, Laura. We've, uh, through our research, we've identified a number of high schools that have a focus on design, and we're looking uh, to make more um, events and outreach opportunities with those groups. Um, you know, it's already a group of, of younger people who have kind of uh, understand the potential of what creating, um, being creative, you know, could include, but they might not have landscape architecture in their minds. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited um, for some of that work that's coming down the pipe uh, for, for MBVA. We're going to be working closely with students, again, sharing our work with new audiences and expanding kind of the, just the, the range of folks who are gonna start college thinking about landscape architecture as mm -hmm. a, a really amazing and viable future for them. That's great, thank you for letting me interrupt. I think you have a few other things you wanted to share with the group, is that right? I think so. So, MVVA is expanding ways to grow and sustain office culture. Um, the most important thing we can do is to have an office that people want to come and work at. Um, and I, you know, I think that um, it's not enough to invite people to your design culture, that you need to embrace them and realize that you are going to be an active part of making them better landscape architects. And so while we, we've always had professional development 
and education, I think that we have set that up through mentorship. Um, first of all, we've always had a buddy system, which is a silly name, but a buddy system for, for starting staff, which means that we you know, pair together somebody who's been around for a while with somebody who's new so that they'll always have somebody to um, explain things and ask questions of. And then Adrian has started a really interesting group um, which is specifically aimed at people who have two years or less experience in the office. And so that makes a mix of different titles, but um, she gives seminars um, every week where she gets people together, allows them to talk about what's going on, but she also invites various people from the firm in to talk about design process or construction, um, it's a way of kind of leveling the field for everybody. And then I, with um, another staff member, um, Alexia Friend, have started seminars for leadership in project management. And what we mean by that is not just how you can manage jobs, not how you can account for things or, you know, look at numbers um, and schedule, but instead to really think about how you as a leader, a project manager can go much further in not only um, encouraging people, but supporting them. And in fact, making room for more work um, in the design field. I think, Oh, is this me? Sorry about that. Um, we're also giving back to um, communities as you've heard Adrian talk about. One of the ways we started was um, to ask staff what they wanted to do. What kind of volunteerism do you wanna see? What kind of pro, pro bono design work do you want the, the uh, firm to take on? And you know, is you, do you have interest in sponsorship or research? Um, and we found that one of the most popular, though neck and neck, um, were, was education and youth outreach and pro bono design work. So we formed a partnership with Neighborhoods Now in New York. Um, we've also been out into design high schools. We've made contact with HBCU um, design schools. Um, we donated money to those who needed some funds for um, getting, making sure that everybody had a computer. And then we're also partnering with uh, Mill Creek Park, um, which is through COG Design, who basically uh, matches designers to groups that need to um, get some work done. And Green Roots is looking to um, build some play spaces along Mill Creek, which is pretty, um, pretty industrialized strip. So they're trying to start the move to flip that. Next. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to project a little bit into the future. So uh, our framework plan is on our website. Uh, we first released it in June 2020. There was an update in uh, February 2021, and it's it's still evolving and forward looking. So, uh, in the coming months, uh, we're looking to sustain our commitments to mentorship, education, and professional development. Um, and also, really crucially, we're going to improve our systems for reporting and addressing workplace issues. This is to ensure that all staff uh, feel safe and really understand uh, what the resources and the support uh, needed. Um, you know, what's available to them and, and um, that they understand how to, how to access that. Um, uh, as Laura already mentioned, uh, we have a firm-wide equity assessment that's gonna be used to shape the trainings ahead for all staff. Uh, and we've already touched on some of our work with community outreach, engagement to schools, and most especially, uh, Laura referenced it as well earlier. You know, this is all occurring uh, during a sort of unique moment in remote pandemic life. Uh, and we're looking ahead uh, to what it'll mean in the coming months when we all get to come back together and share studio space again. So we're looking forward to that for a number of reasons, uh, including what it means for our BLM and, and JEDI goals. So we've learned a lot over this past year and, uh, and we're putting it all into practice. 
So we know that uh, this work will be a sustained commitment by the firm. It's not at all a one and done kind of thing. We're gonna keep revisiting these goals. We have staff members who are uh, really tasked with ensuring follow through in these plans and actions. Um, and it's been, again, a wonderful way for our offices and kind of firm wide to come together on some bigger initiatives. We've also developed a renewed understanding of leadership and team building. So as, uh, as we've mentioned, um, leadership, you know, around these topics, uh, it comes from all levels. It requires everyone to lend a hand. Uh, and it's not something that can just come from a select few, but it, it really needs to be embodied and uh, woven through the day-to-day -day work of the firm. And as we all know, uh, this is effort that takes time uh, and um, it's a commitment that's gonna be ongoing. So, um, Close it up. Uh, some of our big goals here uh, on our website. Uh, Laura mentioned it as well, but on our website as well, there's the opportunity for direct feedback uh, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments uh, about MVVA's commitments to this uh, JEDI framework. So, with that, thank you both. Um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to prioritize the question that we received from a student in the chat. Please. Um, oh, there's two now. Well, we'll go in order that they were received. I think the first one we could touch on pretty briefly because Scott's gonna go much more in depth um, around that, but it's really asking you to think about how you apply these concepts that you've shared with us to your built work. Um, how are you incorporating that um, into your process or even the post-documentation process? Mm -hmm. That is an amazing setup for the second half presentation <laughs> that Scott is going to deliver. Uh, Scott will be talking about MVBA's work in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with an incredible client group and uh, constituency uh, that uh, you know that we work really closely with for many, many years to create a gathering place. Uh, among all of our projects, it's one that it's one that has really such a rigorous and outstanding post-documentation process. Again, we'll talk more about it, but uh, mm. the ways in which the foundation who operate and maintain the park have, the way that they've been able to track and measure the impact um, and the audiences that they're bringing in to, uh, to this amazing public space in Tulsa is, um, it inspires us uh, and it's affecting um, how we're looking to um, kind of uh, analyze and assess our projects in other cities. Uh, because they're just so thoroughly committed to making sure that uh, really every young person, especially, but really every uh, uh, citizen in Tulsa uh, has access to some of the outstanding amenities that they're, um, that they're, that they're putting out there through the gathering place. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Laura? No, you know, I think every landscape architect wants their work to be transformative, to really affect people's lives in a, in a very personal way. And, um, to make the space for people to come together. And I think that Tulsa is, you know, I think many of our projects um, have been able to achieve that, but Tulsa is an extraordinary example of that. So I'm eager to he hear Scott speak as well. What was the other question, Giselle? The other question is um, more specific to uh, hiring. And I think we could generalize it to say, who do you think is hireable by MVVA? Now that you've looked more broadly across thinking about diversity, are you able to hire people who are coming with a out of country degree? Um, are you looking for people at bachelor's, master's level? Any, and it seems like you have a pretty broad range, but maybe just touching on that briefly. Yeah, you know, we're just interested in, in um, there's sort of two things, right? A love of landscapes, um, talent, um, and I'll name another, which is quite honestly, just being a good, decent person. I know that sounds odd, but, you know, there are um, so many times in landscape work that you have to be humble and that you have to sort of say, okay, I'm gonna go back to the drawing board. So um, we have a really strong internship program. Every summer we have about half a dozen in New York and three or four in Cambridge. Um, and that's a great entry into our firm. But I will tell you that that process starts um, early winter or so, um, people approaching our firm to do that. 
Um, it's a great way, even if you decide not to join the firm later, it's a great way for you to get some really um, great training as well. So who's, who, who are we looking for? The best, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a great note to end on, I think. Um, and we can make some space for Rachel and team to transition us. And if you are actually interested in hearing more about how all of these great ideas are being applied to built work, um, you should hang out and check out Scott's talk. Yeah, Giselle, that's a great entrance. Thank you, Laura, Adrian, the three of you. That was that was great, very robust. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break, um, So, or I guess, six minute break um, before Scott's talk. Um, and we hope to see you all back here at 1115. So we'll be starting in at 1115. So see you then. And it's the same channel, correct? Same channel, same chat. Yes, exactly. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Welcome back for our part two of our panel with MBVA. And this will be um, the beginning of Scott's talk where he's presenting on um, Gathering Place, a park for posterity. So welcome Scott um, as we enter into part two. Thank you. Should I get going? Get going, yes. Great, thank you. So I wanted to start with the precursors to Gathering Place and um, the large scale parks we worked on um, and Gathering Place essentially being the natural successor to these two, Brooklyn Bridge Park and Maggie Daly Park. And what I think you'll see in these two parks is a few things. One is that they're made for the people who live within the city. And Maggie Daly Park, which is adjacent to Millennium Park, is almost the opposite in its um, intention of use. Whereas Millennium Park is generally for tourists, it's somewhat symbolic, it's iconic, and it's great to have spaces like that within a city, but there's no reason to repeat that. So with Maggie Daly Park, it was very much an escape within the city. So people who live in the surrounding area can come there, experience outdoor space, experience exuberant activity such as ice skating and rock climbing and playgrounds all for free or for a very reduced price compared to uh, private um, rock climbing, for example. And then Brooklyn Bridge Park, a city that has the least amount of green space than any major city in the country, an area where there's just a tremendous amount of programming. It's inviting to all. There's lots of things to do. There's passive use, there's active use, um, and everything in between. So at MBVA, we've had the luxury of being selective about our work and really focusing our work on these large scale projects that benefit the surrounding communities as much as possible. So Gathering Place was certainly a natural successor to that. However, a gathering place is very different than a traditional park, and we'll get into that. But starting with George Kaiser's vision, who's just an incredibly human being and such a wonderful client, they are dedicated to making Tulsa the best city for children to be born grow and succeed. And what a tremendously amazing vision for a client to have and for a client to hire you. Um, I don't think it would have happened without having Brooklyn Bridge Park and Maggie Daly Park and other projects in our quiver. Um, so it's fun to think about iterative process across projects and uh, creating a, um, a name for ourselves in this type of work. So just to reiterate some of the uh, learning objectives that Adrian uh, said at the beginning of their presentation, we really want to investigate how public space and private philanthropy can advance equity goals. We want to consider multiple ways that designed play spaces can support childhood development. 
and we want to discuss how parks help strengthen communities. The gathering place is located south of downtown Tulsa, and it runs along Riverside Drive. And if you live in Tulsa, you're going to drive down Riverside Drive at some point. It's one of those arterial connectors that people use daily. And I believe the ownership group saw this site as being the location for their gathering place because of its adjacency to downtown. The fact that it was a large contiguous piece of land and it kind of spanned different socioeconomic neighborhoods and was centrally located along arterial roads. And looking at the existing site, just to give you a sense of the, the circulation, both via pedestrians and road, and its adjacency to downtown and its kind of suburban context. And it was a giant flat site. Uh, an old house used to be there, an old horse uh, owner, family who owned horses, and there was a lot of uh, horse infrastructure there. Um, astounding views of downtown Tulsa in all its glory. And there's a few quotes of George Kaiser's throughout the presentation. Uh, this one really sticks for me personally, but George acknowledging that he had the advantage of both genetics and upbringing and looking around and seeing those who did not have these advantages, it became clear to him that he had a moral obligation to direct his resources to repair that inequity. Um, that's just so incredible to have the uh, maturity to, to be aware of your advantages and feel a moral obligation to repair inequity. Um, so that really stuck with me and, and with us at MVBA. And really in 2010, this is what we had. And in 2018, this is what we created. And I just wanna flip back and forth a little bit to see that transformation. And we're gonna go in detail about kind of each garden room after talking about public process and um, the competition proposal. So just another kind of before and after to give everyone a sense of the transformation of the site. The competition started in May 2011. Uh, the George Kaiser Family Foundation reached out to us. They said they wanted to create a gathering place. They didn't know exactly what that meant. They asked several landscape architects to think about it, um, but it could have been everything from a large museum site to you know a more traditional park to a concert venue. Uh, it wasn't totally clear what they meant by a gathering place, and they left it open-ended intentionally so that the designers could really try to tackle the question. And. Our first observation was that there was the Blair property, the former horse property, a uh, rather underutilized city-owned parking lot, the river park system, which connects uh, all the Tulsa neighborhoods north to south, and then the Crow Creek apartments, which are all um, basically too destroyed to even inhabit at this point and owned by GKFF. And what happened was we said, okay, you have these four di disconnected areas. What could we do to weave this site together and make it more of a thread so that the adjacent neighborhoods, the river park system um, could all kind of feel cohesive and connected. So that was one major idea. And ultimately through um, this idea of a giant land bridge, through bringing water as a central element through the site, uh, through reconfiguring Riverside Drive and Crow Creek to the right of the page, we envision this very interconnected, um, very democratic, easy to get to, exuberant, fun, exciting park for all. And as you can see in this image, we had this idea of being able to have really ample parking and a lot of different options on how to get there easily and comfortably. So there's ideas of bus routes, parking, bike routes, just any way to allow people to get here easily and for free was a big concept at the beginning. 
and just uh, the the competition renderings all paired together, I think, start to illustrate this idea of a space where everyone would find something comfortable or exciting or inviting to do. Everything from whitewater, you know, river kayaking to water play areas when it's 100 degrees plus in Tulsa, somewhere to cool down. Uh, lawns that are very pastoral and comfortable. Things that are cool for teens like ropes courses, uh, central gathering lodge where there can be interior programming and uh, just a nice interior space. And then finally, a uh, lawn area for, for people to gather and for flexible programming. So really what they told us, the George Kaiser Family Foundation, is our, they saw our competition winning ideas was that there's something for everyone that's analogous to their gathering place vision. It combined these fragmented sites, which the sum is greater than the parts of it, or the whole. Uh, it's spatially diverse, meaning that you could go to one part one day, enjoy it and leave, and then the next day come to another part and have entirely different experiences. And then water as a unifying element. Uh, as I said earlier, Tulsa has many, many extremely hot days, I think. Last year, the year before, there were 60 days in a row that are 100 degrees plus. So having a, a good sensitivity as to what would make people comfortable environmentally is a big uh, aspect of the project as well. So there was a very robust public engagement process from the very beginning that was both important to MVVA and the George Kaiser Family Foundation. And what that consisted of was showrooms, essentially, where we would have public meetings, where we would fly out and present the vision. But as you can see here, we also wanted to create boards and graphics and data and physical models and leave those up for weeks and weeks and weeks. So if you didn't have the free time on a Tuesday at 7 p.m., you could come anytime that works for you browse the gallery, provide feedback, and really make it accessible to everyone, regardless of your schedule um, and your availability. And what we're able to do was take all that feedback through online surveys and in-person surveys and start to break it down, which was uh, quite the process considering people could make whatever comment they wanted. So trying to categorize those into six different overarching principles and then subdividing that uh, into kind of the, the greatest amount of feedback. So everything from nobody wants a golf course to we want a lot of educational components. We would like public art. Um, we would really like uh, safety and some sort of food and drink options. So we took all that and we broke it down to these principles that allowed us to develop the design further. So create diverse landscapes, and that's both through its ecological aspect and its programmatic aspects, provide a variety of activities, create strategic connections physically to other parts of Tulsa, offer food and drink, be mindful of the neighborhood impacts. There was a lot of uh, concern that this was going to, you know, really affect the daily lives of the people around the park negatively, which I think they don't feel that way now, and uh, utilize the existing site features. And in order to make the gathering place feel of Tulsa, being that we didn't live in Tulsa, we really wanted to get a deep understanding of those landscapes that uh, Tulsans feel connected to. So we scoured the area, everything from local uh, parks like Chandler Park in the bottom left, um, to Osage County, to the Oxley Nature Center, to the tall grass prairies that Tulsa is known for, really visiting these places and getting a sense of them so that the gathering place could feel of Tulsa and for Tulsa and make Tulsans proud of this amazing ecotype that they live in. So as we advanced the design, the physical models got 
more uh, detailed, larger. This allowed people to look at the design at whatever vantage point they felt like. It kind of gave them a sense of this com combining of garden spaces and different programmatic adjacencies that would lend itself to this, this gathering place for all. And so much of that was MVVA working with the uh, George Kaiser Family Foundation and how do we create inviting and comfortable spaces that support GKFS mission. So this portion of the presentation is gonna look at some of the, uh, what I call garden rooms and their adjacency to other rooms and how GKFF has all these initiatives and how, how do we physically build that into a park? How can that, uh, how can those, those visions in this design marry with each other. So we'll start with the patio, which uh, essentially one of the big uh, feedback items we got from the public was low cost food options. Well, at least food options. And then George Kaiser Family Foundation said, okay, but we gotta make it low cost. It has to be attainable for even the lowest income families in the city. So low cost food options for families and even the least expensive scoop of ice cream in Tulsa. So there's a very high end uh, uh, ice cream shop in the patio area. And I believe it's still a dollar a scoop, um, which gets a lot of visitors there in the summer. And this was really our vision at the uh, design level. There were very mature existing oak and black walnut trees around the former house. So we said this would really be what we originally called the beer garden. Now it's called the patio. Um, this would be a great space to send under the shade of trees, to have a drink, to have low cost food options and to have areas for children to play and entertain themselves as well. So a lot of physical models were made um, very detailed, trying to get a sense of that distribution, trying to create conversational spaces, spaces where you'd feel comfortable interacting with people you don't know potentially, and uh, a lot of different seating elements that accommodate groups of two people all the way up to 200. So if you wanted to have a big birthday party here, it would be a very easy option when you're trying to determine the location. And then a final built image, which shows that relationship of eating and drinking and caregivers sitting comfortably. In the background, you can see a sandbox here and a play area so that children can be entertained while their caregivers can be comfortable. And it's just a spot where everyone feels like they can enjoy. Um, as you can see, this place base is one-sided. It kind of all faces the uh, outdoor eating area. And that was deliberate so that you don't need to worry about your children disappearing. They're kind of all contained within this stage set in front of you. And you can have clear and direct sight lines all the way um, through. And then to add to that, and this post-analysis, post-construction analysis, uh, the George Kaiser Family Foundation wants Tulsans to think of the gathering place and know it's a place to get low cost food options, but also free food options. So uh, they have partnered with Hunger Free Oklahoma and it's a food distribution site for those in need. Um, so it, it kind of creates that whole kind of memory of gathering places, the, a spot within Tulsa to get these resources. Next, we'll go to Mist Mountain. And I think the, the matching vision between MVVA and GKFF is this uh, iconic space that make Tulsans proud to be living in Tulsa. That was something that was really important to both us and the foundation, this idea that there were just things that you could brag to your friends about, your family, say, hey, you gotta come to Tulsa. You gotta see this cool thing we have. And, and really make it something that they're, they're proud of. And unfortunately, Tulsa didn't have too much of that, but um, we're, we're working to create these exuberant spaces that you do see photos of that you'd wanna come experience. Even if you live three hours away, you'd be willing to make the drive to, 
to experience. So this is a rendering from inside the lodge, looking out towards Mist Mountain. And the, the vision was a watery space that isn't necessarily for children where adults could feel like they're participating in a playful space, but not feel like they're in a playground. So you can see here, the idea was that there'd be jets of water jumping from uh, one body of uh, one pond to another and all the way up this, uh, this mountain of mist. So again, trying to work that out through design, I just think it's fun and helpful to see how we um, develop these rather complex three-dimensional spaces where you can go under and through and up and around and uh, this, this combination of planting and stone that really um, creates a very comfortable textural of Tulsa space. And then the mist, this is the mock-up of the mist. This is Jen Pendike, a uh, uh, former MVBA staff member, uh, getting a sense of how that feels. And also this water jet area that's deliberately for kids. So again, there's this range of use. There's something that's great for children right next to something that's great for the elderly or caregivers or people without kids. And it's really trying to almost deliberately force different user groups to be right next to one another to kind of unveil uh, who, who Tulsans live around one another. Um, one of the biggest issues in Tulsa is that it's very easy to live in your bubble, just like it is in most cities. You can get in your car, go to your local grocery store, watch the news channel of your choice, go home and live in this very closed circuit system. So our hope with the gathering place is it's one of those instances where you're out and about and you're around your neighbors that you normally would not be around either by choice or um, not by choice, just be by uh, uh, circumstance. So, so that's also a major aspect of the project. And as you can see here, there's just a lot of different ways to interact with water in Mist Mountain. Uh, either if you just want to put your hands in it, if you want to hear it, the auditory impact, the sensorial, the smell, the touch. Um, we really wanted to, for all the senses to be engaged in the space. So like I said, having this draw, having something exuberant that Tolson's would be excited about analyzing the number of visitors. In 2019, there were 3 million visitors to the gathering place. And I think the original projections were maybe 500,000 people would come. So it just was overwhelmingly a success from, you know, the George Kaiser Family Foundation who really wanted people to come and use the, the park. They didn't want to invest all these resources to something that was only used by a few people. So in their metrics, they find it very exciting that that number of people would come and enjoy all of this fun, free activity uh, that Tulsa now has to offer. And in 2020, despite COVID, 2.2 million visitors came to the gathering place. And that's quite impressive. And the importance of outdoor space uh, is even more so important these days with the pandemic and knowing that people still utilized the gathering place and the, the foundation and uh, the city were able to keep it open and keep it safe is a huge accomplishment for the uh, operators. Um, next is the Adventure Play Garden and GKF's, GKFF's vision of really encouraging engagement between caregiver and child. So much of their work is in early childhood development and the importance of that from a social aspect, from a from their, uh, their developmental aspects in every way. And George yet again has this amazing quote that no child is responsible for the circumstances of their birth. Essentially saying, if you're born into a unsafe home or an unloving home or you know anything, it's really not the child's responsibility for that. And how can George's foundation, who, you know, he's part of the giving pledge along with Bill Gates and others, where he 
took half of his money and donated it uh, to to repair this inequity that we spoke about earlier. And how could a how could a playground support this very very uh, ambitious goal of of making Tulsa a great place to be born and grow up and and develop? So we immediately identified the existing forest on the site as the location for the playground. And as you can see on the image of the left, these are the trails that the horses would run through. And they just so happen to be great locations to place paths because they're already compacted. The trees were already used to a lot of uh, circulation and disturbance through these networks. But you can also see this forest was very unsafe. There was a lot of storms, a lot of hanging branches, um, and a, a lot of hazards within this area. So we were able to weave our main circulation through those horse trails, as in this diagram, and essentially cut down those dangerous trees and repurpose them as play structures. So again, um, one of the design principles at the beginning from community feedback was to utilize what's there. And this is the, the way MVVA determined the highest and best use of what was there. So it was keeping the trees that have been there for you know, probably hundreds of years, some of them. And how could we repurpose the ones that were unsafe into unique, fun play elements? And really, we just wanted to marry this idea of very thematic play with play spaces that are catered towards specific age ranges and really push beyond this idea of play spaces for two to five-year-olds and five to 12-year-olds. Because that's what United States building code requires. That's how they define the difference in play spaces. There's two to five and there's five to 12. But is that really the metric we should be using to create a space for children? I think we can do a little bit better. So essentially we determined six unique play gardens within the overall adventure playground, what we call the enchanted forest, the picnic garden, water mountain, the skywalk forest, the ramble, and the royal square. And the idea was that each one of these spaces would cater to different user groups for different reasons. So here's that physical build out. You can kind of see that diagram here a bit. And the thing is when a child is in a space, A, children have a lot of different personality types. Some love big exuberant high adventure play. Some love quiet spaces where they can hide behind a corner and have their own time together. And also, even throughout the day, a kid's personality and mood can change. They can be super into high adventure stuff for one minute, but then all of a sudden get overwhelmed and need something quiet and comfortable to go to. So providing that range of spaces, that range of experiences uh, was paramount to the development of the adventure playground. And a lot of this visioning was done completely from scratch. So these are very early sketches trying to get this idea of a thematic play um, oftentimes children are dealing with very adult situations in their lives, very stressful situations, very sad situations. So if we could provide a playground where they can just transform into a completely different world and, and forget about the stresses of everyday life, where they can pretend like they're a soldier or a prince or a princess or a wizard or whatever they choose to be, it really helps that thematic play take them out of their daily lives and create a world within a world that they get to choose their own adventure and experience how they feel appropriate. So really just trying to develop that more through sketching and working with playground manufacturers. And I think to do something as ambitious as the gathering place, we, we couldn't just go to a catalog and flip through and pick out elements. It all had to be completely custom and exuberant. I also think it's worth acknowledging that in order to make a gathering place for all, you also need to make it exciting for people of um, 
good, um, stable means or, or more wealthy people just as much as uh, people who struggle economically. So we had to beat, you know, the average backyards uh, features. You know, there's a lot of fancy backyards in Tulsa and we needed those people to get out and mix with their neighbors just as much as everyone else. So it needed to be exuberant. It needed to be iconic. It needed to be something that you saw photos of and just said, wow, I got to go to this place because that was truly the way to mix everyone together. So this is just a, again, yet another model shot showing how we worked out the design through all these existing trees. Each little dowel rod represented the caliper of tree and the species with color coding. And we wove all of this play equipment uh, and pathways and materials and furnishings through that existing forest. And then finally getting closer to what the ultimate design was working with manufacturers and ultimately building out that vision. This was uh, fabricated in Germany and brought into Tulsa. And there was actually a parade for the towers where they put them on semi trucks and drove them through the neighborhoods and cities to really draw excitement about the project. So earlier I said, okay, so ages two to five and five to 12, we can do better. Um, Jean Piaget's Stages of Development is a great resource about children's developmental needs and really thinking about what the, the foundations of childhood development are. So everything from health, education, them learning about their emotions, their identity, what their family and relationships mean, what their social skills are becoming, and certainly self-care. Um, how, how does a play space support that. And I think it's always important to acknowledge that when children are born, they got to figure everything out. There's no pre-programming. Everything is through testing the world. And within those stages of development, there's really important factors that I think as playground designers, you need to be cognizant of. For example, from birth to two years, object permanence really isn't a thing. So if your caregiver disappears from you, you don't think they're coming back. You don't understand that when something goes away, it comes back. So creating a space where a, you know, a two-year-old has direct sight lines to the entire environment, especially where the caregiver would sit so that they can continue to have that presence of their caregiver is one of those subtle things that you can do to make it a very comfortable, inviting space. And it's funny because when you start to consider these things, the general public doesn't really know that these are deliberate design moves. But when they go there, they're like, wow, that was such a great place to take my child. He didn't cry at all. Um, he or she, they you know, had a great time. I had a great time. I sat comfortably. I got to take a few minutes out of my day to relax a little bit. And my, my child had a wonderful time. So it's funny because when you start to look into the psychology of the spaces, it's not intended as the, you know, the user of the space knows that these are deliberate acts. Rather, it's really about making that comfortable, inviting space. So here's an example of that. You know, at the, at the age of two to seven, where children are getting more skilled at uh, pretend play. They're thinking of things symbolically. They're developing their emotional skills and their social skills, creating a space that's scaled for them, a table that fits for the length of their legs, totally enclosed with planting, where they can have their own little conversation. Who knows what they're talking about? I'm sure it's wonderful. But really creating spaces for kids of that age group where they feel as theirs is yet another kind of uh, initiative where GKFF's work and MVVA's work can come together. And then a place for performance. You know, you wouldn't look at this space and say, wow, that's a playground, but it has so much to do with that childhood development um, chart that I shared with you earlier about what is the true meaning and purpose of a playground. And it's really for children to assess risk, to develop social skills and to have fun. And another 
kind of post-analysis aspect of the project was uh, GKFF's intent on making this space accessible for all. So as you can see in the summer months when the park is most popular, they have free shuttles that will take you to and from the gathering place. And they're expanding this uh, system more and more each year. The next space we'll go into is Peggy's Pond and this idea of a sense of nostalgia. After the park was built, George often talks about how he wants a space that a child can go to, enjoy, and many decades from now can go back to with his family and say, you know, when I was a kid, I loved this playground or I, I went canoeing in this pond. This idea that you're creating nostalgia and posterity for, you know, this park is built for posterity, for future generations where you can uh, continue, um, continue this love for Tulsa. So the pond is centrally located. It's really the true there, there, the gathering place of the gathering place where we have large lawns that are associated with it. And all of the programming occurs within this core area. It's also uh, an ecological engine for the park where we're taking all of the impermeable surfaces, redirecting it into the pond. The pond then cycles it up into a wetland treatment garden and cycles it back down. And this was all developed with consultants to make it this, this uh, ecological engine and also a self-sustaining system. So again, posterity do doesn't have to do with just how the space is used, but how it grows over time. And the fact that it doesn't negatively impact the infrastructure around it as well. So there's a lot of aspects to that posterity um, component of the project. So this is a view down the axis of the of Peggy's Pond using this Olmsteadian idea, Frederick Law Olmsted Central Park idea that spaces feel larger when they disappear behind corners. So this pond is not that gigantic, but it feels much larger because it disappears around the spaces and it has this sense of boundlessness. And as I said earlier, if you live in Tulsa, one day you could come, go for a canoe ride, have an ice cream, and the next day come and go somewhere else in the park and have an entirely different experience. So as I said, that central gathering place, that's where all the programming happens. And a lot of this is targeted programming that, that uh, is for communities that may have not had a celebration of their culture in Tulsa before. So Tony Moore, who's just a wonderful park operator, was able to really determine um, what, what are those groups that just, there's not a, a way to celebrate their culture and how can you invite others um, into that and enjoy it as well. So the Caribbean Vibes uh, event is very popular. La Fiesta de Tulsa, Tulsa in Harmony. Um, faith and spirituality is very strong in Tulsa. It's the buckle of the Bible belt. So that's a big component in their culture and it's important for them. So creating an event that people with, uh, you know, particular faith, um, you know, religions can come together and be together as well and, and share that with others who choose to, to attend. Um, the Sky Garden is above one of the land bridges. And this is really talking about the ecotype. And again, making Tulsa proud about where they live and what that ecotype is. So this was an area really designed as a passive space, something where you could see the textures of Tulsa, kind of this prototypical planted garden um, of the Tulsa Prairie. And you can see the rendering here, again, using that sandstone that has such a, a beautiful kind of golden orange color contrasted by native plantings is the vision. And then here's an aerial of that built project. And really that, that amazing palette of plants that grows in Tulsa that most Tulsans don't really know of. This is a primrose in the spring that just blankets all the plant beds. Um, 
And it's funny, if you look at the one star reviews, which there are of Gathering Place on Google, you'll see a lot of people think this is just unmown, unmaintained lawn, but really educating Tulsans that meadows are entirely appropriate. And if nature had its way, they would be everywhere, really showcasing that so that you don't need a mown lawn everywhere where you're over irrigating and wasting water and adding pollutants to the air. How, how can we transform people's understanding of meadows as a good thing and something that they might want to consider in their own homes or at least allow public spaces to be a little bit more wild and woolly um, is certainly one of the aspects of the project. And there's also a big significance to some of that horticulture to um, the indigenous cultures of Tulsa. And in the design phase, we actually met with the indigenous cultures and understood if they had any, um, if we could marry any of their, the important aspects of their cultures with the, the park as well. And then also just creating, again, another space for indigenous cultures to celebrate their culture and share it with others in Tulsa. And uh, the Four Seasons Garden meets GKF's vision of comfortable spaces for the elderly, really trying to mix age groups together more. Um, I think in other parts of the world, you see that the elderly are much more integrated in their community along with children. It's much more common to have uh, many different generations all mixing together. And unfortunately, over the last several decades in American culture, you see more separation of that. So mixing the age groups and you know, going beyond ages two to five and five to 12 to zero, to 120, I think is really the, the way we thought about Gathering Place as we programmed it. So the Four Seasons Garden is a space that um, has a very gradual slope to it. It's incredibly shady. There's a lot of seating options. There's a lot of textures. There's a lot of smells, a lot of sensorial stimulation in it. And there's little placards on all of the plants. So you can walk through and kind of learn about the trees and species. So it's a place to kind of contemplate, to move slowly and to kind of feel the, the textures around you. And a lot of that, um, just going back to our local site visits was inspired by Chandler Park where you have these tight, narrow canyons that you move through and uh, experience. So again, that was all worked out through model. These are all very three-dimensional spaces. So 2D drawings weren't doing it for us. So working it out through model, getting into the detail of some of those um, jointing patterns and really making it feel of Tulsa. And subtle things that most people won't notice, but at the quarries, you'll see that the lowest layers have higher compressive strength and are less oxidized. So you get this grayish color. And as you go to the top of the stone horizon, it gets more orange and more oxidized. So repeating that within the strata of the, uh, the coursing of the stone is yet another way to make this place feel extremely of Tulsa um, in both subtle and very um, impactful ways. So as I said, spaces for the elderly, um, War veterans are um, very well respected in Tulsa's community and it was important that they felt comfortable and invited there. So again, there's just a lot of different community engagements. George Kaiser Family Foundation really working on targeting and understanding all of those categories um, and thinking about how to make this space for them. Um, and then Looking at the skate and BMX park, there's only a few more spaces to go. I actually think this might be the last one, but how can we make cool spaces for teenagers? Um, so oftentimes teenagers are the lost age group in programming. You kind of jump from playgrounds for kids and then everything else for adults. And then teenagers are often seen as these liabilities that 
just cause trouble and do bad things in parks and, oh, they're such a nuisance. So how can we make something that's really cool for them? And I think that you've, you probably have a skate park in your hometown. It's probably somewhere off in the middle of nowhere, some very underutilized, unimportant piece of land that has no uh, safety aspects to it. There's nothing, no other programmatic uses next to it. And then all of a sudden you have these problems there because not because of the people necessarily skateboarding, but this environment that you're putting it in. So we made it a very deliberate act to put this skate park right at the entry to this side of the park. So you cross Riverside Drive and right when you get there, it's front and center. It's adjacent to swing sets and um, rope net climbing structures. So if you're not a skateboarder, if you just want to hang out, you have cool places to sit and hang out. There's a BM BMX pump track as well. And then finally a lawn where you can comfortably sit either as a caregiver or if you just need to take a break from skating. And in order to engage the teens of Tulsa, we created a special workshop in the design phase where we invited pro skateboarders out and the Tulsa skating community and really developed this thing together. We had little cutout templates, we had plans, and they were able to, to clip and paste and kind of work together to create their own skate park. And then ultimately we had them present their ideas and then went back to the drawing board with our consultant, California Skate Parks, and worked out this idea of what sort of skate environment they'd want. Um, and this was certainly one of the most exciting elements of the park considering a lot of people would sneak into the construction site and skate it before the park opened, which is hilarious. Um, and we're totally supportive of. <laughs> um, and then just trying to illustrate this idea that next to the Four Seasons Garden, which is for you know older communities, next to the Sky Garden that's really for people who are interested in horticulture, you have this high active use like a bike park, then you have a passive use like a picnic lawn, then you have a high active use like a skate park, and then a stormwater treatment landscape, which is yet another passive use. So to kind of mix these together in such a deliberate way, um, I think you can see I've repeated myself quite a few times in saying that really encourages you to be around people you wouldn't normally deliberately choose to be around. And just showing how that all is illustrated together. Um, we really wanted it to feel vegetal and comfortable with shade. I think oftentimes skate parks are so blistering hot and um, devoid of shade or any sort of comfort. It's just not a very fun place to stay a long time at. So those were some of the initiatives as well. And fitness in general is one of uh, the big programmatic elements in the gathering place after it's been built. There's a lot of free fitness events and health and wellness uh, activities and gatherings related to that as well. And uh, the, the park has received a lot of accolades, which is great because we feel like it gets more um, a wider audience. So people who wouldn't normally think to research a, you know, a free park to go to in Tulsa, learn about it through USA Today, through Time Magazine, through National Geographic. So it's really a way to just cast the net wider and get the word out there that this place exists. And I think this photo really sums it up. It is a gathering place for all. And if you see the people enjoying this event, it's really what the goal was for everyone to feel comfortable, for everyone to gather together, for everyone to have fun, and for everyone to love Tulsa. Um, just to give you a little glimpse of what is next, and this is my last slide, um, we are now working with the George Kaiser Family Foundation to develop Turkey Mountain, where you can see downtown Tulsa here, the gathering place here, and this is really the yin to the gathering places yang. And it's more providing a free, safe, 
and comfortable, um, more national park type experience, more true nature experience, um, rather than a park experience for Tulsa's. So if you don't have the means to own a very fancy mountain bike and drive 200 miles to go experience wild nature, Turkey Mountain will be that for you. And we are working with the George Kaiser Family Foundation to, to provide that for Tulsa as well. So our work is ongoing in Tulsa. We are so thankful to have the George Kaiser Family Foundation as a client. We're so thankful to have this precedent that we can now share with future clients. Um, Adrian is highly involved in Dix Park in Raleigh, and we were actually able to take that client group to Gathering Place to show them how much of a success this park is and the importance and the work that they have on their end uh, to make these parks a success. So now that we have this precedent, we use it every way we can. We've gotten a lot of phone calls from cities of the same size and kind of general Midwest location of Tulsa saying, hey, we see the impact this has on the community. How do we do this? So it has been a great um, example of how a park can become a gathering place. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. That was that was wonderful and so so comprehensive. Um, thank you. So we're going to be filtering questions through the Q and A chat function. Um, and while we sort of um, have those roll in, I, I did have some questions, um, Scott, about about things you were talking about, and I was wondering for of your assessment of sort of the economic benefits of the gathering. Uh, the gathering space and how um, how maybe there were opportunities for people in the community to become the environmental stewards of the land. Were there job opportunities for, for people? So I'm curious about that. Yeah, so um, one of, there's so many great things that the George Kaiser Family Foundation does, but one of them is that they look at women in prison who have children and are in prison for nonviolent offenses. And they've done a lot of work on um, how much of a negative impact that has on their families. And they've actually at the restaurants hired almost all people with criminal backgrounds um, that have a very high difficulty getting jobs elsewhere. Um, all are hired, kind of prioritized at the gathering place. So they have an endowment for their maintenance and operations, and it is a very generous endowment. And they hire, I think, hundreds of staff each year, almost more than they need to, to kind of create that rehabilitation, or at least give people the confidence after going through a traumatic event in their life, like going to prison, they can come there, work in a restaurant, give used to interacting with the general public and again, help them get on their feet and move on. So they, it's, they're just, uh, they're such a special client. You know, this is, that doesn't happen too often. Yeah, that sounds like a dream partnership, really. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as well, and as we talk about sort of the people that you're making this space accessible to um, and how MBVA is so great with their models, right? Like we always associate the big model with MBVA. And so it got me thinking a little bit about the design literacy tools that you present to the public. And if you could talk about things that the public responds to better and sort of things that you find the public doesn't really understand. Um, and in addition to that, the, the model as an artifact in flux, right? So how do people actually, are they actually drawing on the model? Are they changing things around the model? Um, at times, and I, I would say both Adrian and Laura have had a lot of experience in public process as well. So I'd love for them to jump in also. Um, I guess the point I wanna make is that very different than a rendering, you're not choosing the vantage point and the content of and developing over the course of several weeks. You're, you're making something that people can choose to look at and understand however they want and ask the questions that they want. Um, for the gathering place, other than the skate park, that was really where we invited the community to draw and create with us. 
there wasn't really an instance. I know on our Detroit Riverfront project, we did the same thing with the playground and invited children from schools where they had clay and they could help kind of create a world within the play environment. Um, so that really getting that on hands engagement galvanizes the community, gets them excited about it, gets them talking about it, which is one of the important aspects of a project is to build up that momentum. And I don't know if Adrian or Laura have anything else to add to that. Probably too much for the time allotted, but uh, just <laughs> briefly, <laughs> two thoughts come to mind. Um, Scott, you offered some connections between our work in Tulsa with the work that MVVA has been doing in Raleigh uh, at, at Dorothea Dix Park with the city of Raleigh and uh, the Dix Park Conservancy, two amazing organizations really seeking some transformation for a big parcel there. Um, for that project, uh, I would say uh, pre-COVID times, we were we did have a lot of success in bringing large models to public events. Uh, and, and one thing that I love about that is, especially in a more of a planning phase, um, we would bring models that were a little messy in the sense that uh, we'd use mm -hmm. them um, at, you know, after a more formal presentation with slides. Uh, the second half of that event might be out front with the model with MVVA and other design team staffers and representatives from um, the client group, uh, looking at a model with pieces of construction paper and ripping them up making changes, making sure that everyone who's participating and present at such an event kind of understands uh, the, the, the real flexibility and the real kind of moment of opportunity that planning is to, to affect some change and how a, a particular piece of land is, is altered. And then post COVID, uh, there's also been some really great um, kind of new tools uh, that we you know, maybe wouldn't have accessed in the past, but the requirement to go all remote with engagement um, specifically for Dix Park uh, has been really exciting for us. We've been able to um, track in a more concrete way the participation in different events that we've had because literally you can see who's signing up, where they're coming from, their zip codes, um, things like that. And so through a specific tool called publicinput.com, which through that offers all sorts of things like polls and um, different ways that we can put up images and folks can kind of put comments uh, via sticky notes digitally it's allowed us to be so much more confident that we're reaching the right communities and realize immediately when we're not. Um, and so therefore responding and following up with some more targeted outreach uh, to make sure that the, either the zip codes or the communities that we, we didn't see at that last event, that we make sure that they get the information that they need as our design continues. I'll just say one thing about uh, models. First of all, um, nothing will explain your design better than a model to yourself, as well as to the people that you're working with. Um, the other is that we may not realize this, but making a model for clients and constituents is a really respectful thing to do. It takes a lot of effort, um, but it, it invites um, comment when you do something like that. Sometimes people don't know how to react to perspectives and many people don't know how to read plans. And so it's it's such a great um, tool and not enough landscape architects make them, frankly, both students and professionals. Yeah, as a student, especially in post COVID times, I would agree. Um, I'm just gonna ask you all one quick question. We have about three minutes left. Um, and it was about, you know, in the gathering place, there are so many wonderful, you know, MVVA details, right? We have those walls, especially, I forget which area it was, but it kind of reminds me of our own Bailey Plaza, the blue mm -hmm. stone fountain of Teardrop Park. So I'm wondering if there's been a reassessment of, you know, those telltale details and the extent to which they're um, being incorporated into your sort of evaluation of equity and design. Laura, I feel like you're the stone aficionado on this call. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, first of all, stone is common to almost every place that you work in, right? And so bringing that forward for people to see is such a terrific thing to do. It ties them to the landscape in a different way. We always think about trees and you know, lawns is kind of the connection to the community, but there's a whole other, you know, envelope of materials to choose from, and stone is certainly one of those. 
And I wouldn't say that we've changed our detailing as much as we've gotten much better at it. And I think we were pretty good in, in Teardrop Park, but I mean, if you look at the gathering place, it's extraordinary, right? It's extraordinary. And so um, it's not that we don't repeat ourselves. We just try to get better when we do. Mm -hmm. I can add one thing to that, which is just the sheer weight, the expense, mm. the investment that goes into creating a space where stone is celebrated and used and kind of, you know, makes the statement is, um, is, you know, in some ways that's an obvious observation, but I think to tie it to the equity moment, it is a, sort of a symbolic um, piece of our designs, many of them, um, that I think we can connect to kind of the richness of the local community, the kind of a, a showcase, if you will, of like what's really special in the case of uh, the Tulsa example, we were connecting to Chandler Park and other local geology, mm -hmm. bringing that into a public environment um, you know, that's a, a wonderful space that the city already has, but it's a little bit more on the fringes by making that investment, um, using stone as the medium, um, like in the public space of the park, uh, there's a certain um, just um, celebration of, of the local ecology of, and by extension, kind of the community there. So um, I don't know, I see that as important, um, you know, in the past in our work and certainly ahead. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Laura, Adrian, Scott, and Giselle. That was uh, wonderful to hear from you all. And, and I'm going to close our, our uh, session now and let our attendees um, attend for the rest of the conference. But thank you again. That was wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, thank you all. Bye.